All right, section 4.1 is um, going to change directions from what we have been doing. What we have been working on in all the sections up till now has been this idea of derivatives. And this says antiderivatives. So whenever we put the word anti or the phrase or um, prefix, I think is the right word, prefix anti in front of a word, what does that prefix mean? The opposite of or not, right? We have this sort of a phrase in front that's ch that changes it to the negation of what it was before. So what we're going to be doing in this section and into all of chapter four is the opposite of a derivative or an antiderivative. Um, somebody asked, and I'll say it now because I'll probably forget to say it later, um, another word that means the same thing that you will hear me use interchangeably is the word integral, okay? So if you hear me use the word integral, and we'll come across a definition where I, I mention it, but I want to emphasize that, that that word integral um, is going to mean the same phrase as antiderivative. So I, I, I just go back and forth. I don't even think about it when I say it. I, I use them interchangeably. Come on in. So what I want you to do first is I want you to fill in the front sheet of your notes. The front sheet of your notes is a list of your derivative rules. Okay, just we've been doing these all the way along. This isn't anti anything. This is just your derivative rules. Okay, so this is the first sheet, uh, or the first half of your sheet, and the second half is all your trig rules. So fill those in, and then we're going to make sure everybody has the same um, the same derivatives down, so that we didn't have any of those that we have uh, forgotten or kind of, kind of switched with each other or anything. Um, and then we'll we'll chat. A few of you are starting to wrap things up. If you're not quite done, it's okay. Um, we're going to fill them all and make sure everybody has the right, um, the right derivatives written down. Uh, the first one, the constant rule, what is the derivative? So the A's and the B's and the K's, all those are just letters. They're variables. Uh, or they're, uh, they're constants in the problems, numbers. Um, what is the derivative when we just have a number? Zero. zero. So the first one should say Y prime equals zero. How about that second one, the linear function rule? What is Y prime there? Right, it's just the coefficient of the x, uh, because remember the derivatives are slopes, so this is y prime is a. How about the third one, the constant multiplier rule? What happens when we have a number in front of a function? It's k, so the number just stays, and then we have f prime of x. Uh, what happens if we have a sum or a difference of functions? Right, each piece separately, and then we combine them the same way they were already combined. Right, Mandy? Mm -hmm. So the addition or the subtraction, whichever was between them, is still between them. Um, and you'll remember that that's actually really, really nice because it doesn't work when we get to products and quotients, right? We can't do that. Uh, how about this last one on this particular slide? 
We bring the n down, and then we rewrite the x to 1 power less, n minus 1. Um, and we'll come back to that one in our discussion a little bit later because that's a, uh, an interesting one when we do the antiderivative for it. How about trig rules? Derivative of sine. Cosine, good. Derivative of cosine? Negative sine. Good, and I keep saying without the x's, but of course you know that they're there. Uh, how about tangent x? Right, that is secant squared of x. And then secant x? Good, secant x, tangent x. Now cotangent and cosecant are very similar to tangent and secant, right? Uh, so what is the derivative of cotangent? Yeah, it's cosecant squared and then, oops, let me get that in there. And then, it, yes, it is negative. So one of the things that I have mentioned before is that the ones that start with co, right, cosine, cotangent, and we're about to do cosecant, all have a negative derivative. Um, so then the derivative of cosecant is actually negative what? Cosecant x, cotangent x. Okay, so this is just review, right? We've just filled in details that you already knew coming into class today. Good. What we're going to do now is we're going to reverse it. Um, before we reverse it, we're going to talk a little bit about some notation things that are going to be helpful for us. Um, one item is that you will notice that if you're starting out with a function f, um, and we talk about its antiderivative, they're going to use a capital F. All right, so kind of like on these previous slides when we started out with a y, the derivative was y prime. The notation, we're going to go with it backwards, is going to be taking, for instance, on this slide, the y's are going to become a capital Y. Okay, the antiderivative is going to use a capital letter. Um, the other thing that you'll sometimes see used is they might actually give you a function f prime, right? They give it to you as a function f prime, and then you would just make this f. It's going backwards. We're being given, basically what we're doing is we're being given something that could be interpreted as a derivative, and we are finding the original function. That's one interpretation of what we're doing. So I've called this an antiderivative. It's also called an indefinite integral. Um, integral is what we sort of say for short. We will talk about something called a definite integral later. Um, it is with respect to x, that is x is the variable that this is sort of being described in terms of on some interval i. And you'll notice down here a little piece of information, a couple things. Here's that capital F of x, right? On the left hand side you'll see that little lowercase f of x and you'll see some notation around it. There's two pieces of notation around it and when one occurs so does the other. This symbol and this symbol. That sort of skinny script S and that dx go together. If you, you, you can't have one without the other. All right? they, they occur simultaneously. So that script S and that dx tell you that we want the antiderivative and the dx says with respect to x. It's kind of like when we were doing derivative notation and we did df dx like this. Right? We want the derivative of f and then it's with respect to x. <clears throat> All right, the other thing that you'll notice in this uh, underlined piece that's described is you'll see this plus c on the end. Um, that c is called, is, is an arbitrary constant, it's called the constant of integration. And the basic idea is this, if you had a graph, and I'm going to draw two graphs, and they're supposed to look pretty much the same. Okay, so we've got one graph, it looks like this, and the other graph that looks just like this, but it's going to be shifted down a little bit. If they really were the same graph and just shifted in, you know, different directions from one another, right, one's shifted up or down from the other one, and I do mean up and down, we can go left and right, it's got to go up and down, then what you'll notice is that every, every, at every x value, the slope value is the same for the other graph. Does that make sense? So if I picked this particular x value right here, and I had that same x value right here, and I drew those tangent lines there, they'd be the same tangent line. The slope would be the same for each of those tangent lines. So when I do this shifting up and down, what happens is I get the same derivative, right? Um, and in fact, if I gave you some equation, you would, you would do it too. If this f of x is the x cubed graph, which was what I was intending for it to look like, and this f of x was x cubed 
minus 3, and you took the derivative of each one of them, they'd be the same, wouldn't they? So the problem is that when I start with a derivative and I go backwards, what happens is the graph could have been shifted up or down from what I actually got. That's what that plus C is doing. That plus C is representing that there could be a shift up or down that didn't affect the slope of the graph. So we put a plus C on there to indicate that ability to have that shift in there for the original graph. Okay? So what I'm wanting you to recognize is that that plus C is valuable and it's important. And we'll have one question at the very end where we actually find the C value and you can see how we go about doing that. But every time you work on one of these indefinite integrals, you're going to have a plus C, okay? It doesn't matter. C could be positive or negative. Okay, so, so if we just put plus or minus C then? You don't really need to since C can be a positive or a negative number. The plus C is just indicating that we're adding a constant and it could be any constant. Okay. So it, it wouldn't necessarily be wrong. It'd just be sort of like overkill. It'd be like putting plus or minus a positive or a negative and you're kind of like double stating the same thing. So. The convention that's just used is plus C for that. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through some deriv anti-derivative rules. And in doing so, I want you to think, and in some cases I'll even use the descriptive phrase, what in the world would have given me this derivative? So how in the world did I get a derivative of zero? What would have happened for that to happen? A you would have had just a constant. And so as a general, um, right now we're going to be using the constant to be C. So we're going to just say that that means that you had original graph that was C. Right, so if you had C, its derivative would have been zero. So the antiderivative of zero is C. How in the world would you have gotten a derivative that was simply a number? Right, it would have looked like that line, right? So kx and then plus a constant C. So that's like our linear rule that we had from the other slide, right? So if you flip back and forth on your sheets of paper or look back, if you've got them side by side, it's, this, it's the linear rule in reverse. Now, the constant multiplier rule looks just like the constant multiplier rule of the other one. So what would the antiderivative look like if I've told you that already? And I don't intend for my k's to look like they're becoming capital or uncapitalized. It's just k. Yes, plus c. Let me, I'll put that here in just a second. So the k stays, right, just like it did when you took a derivative. And the antiderivative of little f of x is capital F of x. And then just like Ben said, we do still need that plus c. It still has the ability to shift up and down. What do you think is going to happen when we have a um, sum or a difference? Yeah, we take the sum or the difference exactly like we did with derivatives. <coughs> we take each piece individually. So my capital y, my function, will be capital F of x plus or minus capital G of X plus C. Very good. Yes, we still need the plus C. I'm not quite out of space there, but you can put yours in probably. The power rule is probably the first one that's a little bit interesting. Okay. So think with me. What did we do when we did the power rule before? I know some of you already know this rule, so humor me for the moment. Okay, I'm looking at you, Ben. Humor me. All right, so... What did we do when we had a derivative? We brought the power down. We brought the power down as a multiplication, right? Okay, so what's the opposite of multiplication? Division. division. So we're going to have some division in here. What did we do to that new exp or that previous exponent that we had? Subtracted one. Subtracted one. And what's the opposite of subtracting one? Okay. Adding one. So that's actually where I'm going to start. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our function and we're going to add one to the exponent. Now, I mentioned previously that um, we were multiplying, and we're going to be dividing now. Previously, we <laughs> multiplied by the first exponent, the original exponent we had. So what we're going to do now is we're going to divide, but we're going to divide by the new exponent that we have. <clears throat> so the division ends up being by n plus 1. Okay, we don't divide by the original exponent, we divide by the new exponent. And, of course, there's a plus C on the end here, but let me talk to you a little bit about how you can confirm to yourself that this makes sense. If I were to take x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 and take the derivative, I would take the n plus 1 down to the front, which would then cancel with that denominator, wouldn't it? 
and I would decrease that exponent, and if I had n plus 1 and I decreased it by 1, what would I get? x to the n, and that's what I was got over here. And then the plus c, of course, becomes 0 because the derivative of a constant is nothing. Okay. So that's, that makes sense. We look at it from that perspective and we see, yep, that's exactly what we wanted it to be. Everything happened in reverse. All right, tell me, when you take a look at this list, this list does not look quite like the trig list that you originally had on the other sheet of paper. Why not? What's different? Okay, so we're missing some negatives, right, in terms of the list right there. But and what else do we see? It's what would be the derivatives of the other. So what do we not see then, Mandy? The basic. Trig we don't see a list of basic trig functions here, right? There's no tangent, there's no secant, there's no cosecant, and there's no cotangent, right? I don't have any of those listed here. All I actually really have is I have the derivatives from that other list, and some of them are missing negatives. Do you guys see that? I promise we're going to get to find out later what the derivative or the antiderivative is for the, the four that are missing, because there's four that are missing. Um, but those aren't the ones we're working with today, okay? They'll occur later. So we're working with these particular ones, which really just were the derivatives we previously had. And we're missing some negatives, so we're going to include some negatives in when we do our antiderivative. So let's start with this. What in the world would I have had to do to get a derivative of sine? I would have had to have cosine, and I would have had to have the opposite of it, because if I were to take the derivative of cosine, it would be negative sine, and this is actually positive sine, so I need the opposite. And on all these, we're going to have that plus c, so I'll write my plus c in there. How about cosine? How would I have gotten an antiderivative of cosine? Yep, that would be just plain old sine. Derivative of, antiderivative of cosine is sine. And then we've got our plus c. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. They're opposite on your sheet. How about, I think that's a copy-paste thing that I was doing, actually. Um, how about secant squared? What in the world's going on in that? How did I get a derivative of secant squared? That is tangent of x, right? And this plus c. How did I get a derivative of secant tangent? That was secant x plus c. Mm -hmm. What about cosecant squared? <coughs> that is cotangent of x, and it is negative, yes. And cosecant cotangent? That's negative cosecant plus c. Okay, so you've got your list here now of basic antiderivative rules. And this list is exactly what you need in order to be able to take the basic antiderivative skills quiz that you're going to be working on, okay? This is all there is. There's not going to be, I'm not going to ask you for the antiderivative of tangent because it's not on the list, okay, and so forth. All right, so taking a look at these now, so have those sort of handy as we're working. We're going to work through... I think I've got seven examples for us today. The first six are going to be basically what you would see on the basic skills quiz, except that in the end we'll simplify right now. If you were working on the quiz, you would actually not have to simplify. Okay? All right, first one. Now, on some of these problems, and on this particular one, it's really easy to look at them, or at least it might be easy for you to look at them, and just ask yourself, like I've been asking you on those rules, how would I have gotten a derivative that was 2x? What would I have started with? X squared. x squared. So I didn't actually even sort of use the rules. I just sort of thought backwards. Some of them are not as easy to do that with, and, and that's we'll, we'll get into the actual rules part of that in a second. How about the negative 3x squared? That would have been minus x cubed. And I need a plus c. Exactly. So what's, why is there the dx? Like, is that just These pieces that always occur at the same time. Okay. The notation actually means, at the beginning, I want an integral, and the dx in the means with respect to x. Okay. Um, and so it, it's kind of like um, there are certain um, aspects in different foreign languages where when you see one piece of a language occur, another piece always goes with it. Um, right? We wouldn't say, sit down at desk. We would always say, the desk. Right? The the goes with it. It's kind of like that. 
These pieces of language simply go together, all right? This one's really nice because there's no simplifying to do. We're actually finished with it, right? Okay. Now let's say for a moment that you didn't recognize this 3x squared, or maybe even it wasn't 3x squared, maybe it was 6x squared. And so it's not quite so easy to see, hey, that's just that, you know, same, how would I have gotten 6x squared? That sort of feels a little bit more awkward. You can use your antiderivative rules. The 3 gets rewritten. That's a constant multiplier. The x squared is the x to the n rule. You take the x and you increase the power by 1, so the 2 becomes a 3. And then you divide by the new power of 3, and then you notice that the 3s would cancel. Okay, so if you don't readily recognize one, or if it was something like this 6x squared, the 6 is the um, constant multiplier, the x squared becomes x cubed, and then divide by the new power 3, and then the 3 and the 6 can reduce on this one. Sorry, I'm writing on top of my other writing. You'd have the ability to reduce this. <coughs> and we're going to do an application. We're going to do one of those, actually, on number two. All right, so on some of these, they don't fit nice and neatly exactly as they're currently written with the rules, so we want to change them so that they will. How can I rewrite this so that the rules that I have actually apply to this particular function? I'll make that x to the negative 6. I still have the minus 2. Anytime the script s is written, the dx needs to be there. Now, your book actually sticks pretty closely with all the variables being x within a problem. Some books don't do that. Um, and you may occasionally have a t in your problem instead. So if t were the variable, you'd have a dt at the end. Okay. The other thing that you'll see some books do, I just want you to be aware of it so that you don't think there's anything special going on, is they may in fact have parentheses around this quantity to indicate that all of that is what's being taken um, as an antiderivative that you're looking for. Your book doesn't tend to do that either, I don't think. It's, it's a, it's a non-common convention. Either way, it can go, and it, and it works, okay? All right, so we're going to use our new rules. What do I do to take that x to the negative 6? What's the rule? Add 1 to the power. So what is negative 6, and then I increase it by 1? Negative 5. Be careful, because we are willing with a negative there. And then I will divide that by negative 5. Okay, so that's the first piece. How about the negative 2? <clears throat> All right, it's negative 2, and then we just associate the x with it. I don't want to use the word add, but we multiply it now by an x. We include it, right? Mm -hmm. And then we need the plus c on the end. If you were working on your antiderivative quiz, you could stop right there. However, in your homework problems and your test problems and so forth, if the original problem starts out with a positive exponent in the denominator, right, like that, your final answer needs to also have positive exponents in it. Okay? So I need to do what to get this to be a positive exponent? Take it to the denominator. So I will have a 1 in the numerator now, right? And I'll still have that negative 5 in the denominator, or you can put the negative in front if you'd like. And then I'll have an x to the positive 5 exponent also, minus 2x plus c. Any questions on those details and simplifying at the end? Is that okay? All right, let's do another one similar to this. I've got square roots, and as you know, there was no rule that, dealt you told, that showed you how to deal with square roots, so what are you going to have to do? Powers, right. So right now, I've got an x to the 1 in the denominator, and I've got a square root of x, which is an x to the 1 half. So how can I rewrite that differently? X to the negative 3 halves. Right, right now in the denominator I have 1 plus 1 half, which is 3 halves. It's in the denominator, so I'll pull it up to the numerator. I'll make it a negative. And if I still have the script S, I still have the dx. This is the same rule as the last one, right? At least the first part of the last one. I've got x to the negative 3 halves. So I increase that exponent by 1. So what will it become? Negative 1 half. And then what will I do? Actually, I'll divide by negative 1 half, right? 
And I will change it to the multiplication you suggested in just a moment, Ben. Yep, so divide by negative one-half. And then I need plus C. Let me just scare you a little bit. I had a student one time do his basic skills quiz. He did every problem perfect except no plus, C. no plus C's, which means he would have had a 20 out of 20. Instead, he had a 0 out of 20, so he missed his bonus. Don't worry, he got an A at the end of the course. But in the meantime, he was very frustrated at his himself um, when he realized that that's what he screwed up on. All right, so don't you let that happen to you. All right, so Ben, you mentioned that the division by a 1 half, or a negative 1 half is what we actually have, is the same as multiplication by 2, and in this case it's negative 2, right? This is actually negative 2x to the negative <laughs> 1 half plus my c. Now the original problem started out as a denominator um, had the x's and it had square roots, right? So my original problem telling me I had square roots means that this one also needs to have square roots and no negative exponents in the original problem, so no negative exponents in my answer. So how do I get rid of the negative exponents? Put it in the denominator. And then how do I get rid of that power of 1 half? I'll put it in square roots. So the negative 2 doesn't move anywhere. It stays on top. And I now have the square root of x in the denominator. And of course, I have the plus c at the end. Now let me just ask you. I know you guys sort of cringe when I give you even problems, because you know I like to grade those more than I grade the odd problems, right? But I contend that it really makes no difference in this section, because you can know whether or not you got the answer right before I tell you if you did. Why? You could take the derivative of your answer and see if it matched back up with the original problem, couldn't you? Now, I agree, that's going to be a lot of work, but if you really wanted to know or if you were really concerned about a particular problem, you have the ability to check yourself on these problems, and that's kind of nice. All right, how about this one, number four? If you'll remember, this list of rules that I gave you, none of it had anything to do with a product rule. In fact, product rules, when you do antiderivatives, are really complicated. And in fact, you won't learn them all, the ability to deal with that in this particular class. Those of you who are fortunate enough to get to take Calc 2 will get to work more with them in Calc 2. Yay for you. Yes, it's fun. It's like a puzzle. Okay, so I say all of that to let you know that when you see a product, you're not going to handle it like a product. What are you going to have to do? You need to multiply that out or foil that out, okay? We need to get this into looking something like one of our basic rules. And in this particular one, the easiest way to deal with that is to actually multiply it out or foil it out. So the first term is 3x times, I'm sorry, x times 3x, which is 3x squared. So that's my first term. My outer term is x times negative 2, so negative 2x. My inner term, 1 times 3x, which is 3x. And then my last term, 1 times negative 2, is negative 2. Uh, you could work from here if you want. I'm tempted to go ahead and simplify it one more time before I get started, because the negative 2x and the positive 3x could combine to simply x in the middle. If you don't simplify that piece of it right now, it's fine. You just are going to have to simplify it at the end and combine the like terms. So you're going to combine them somewhere along the way. All right, so 3x squared. What's the antiderivative of 3x squared? x cubed. We've actually already done that one today, haven't we? What would the antiderivative of x be? Right, so the power right now on the x, although you don't see it, there's an understood 1 there, right? So I increase that power by 1 to be x squared and I divide by the power, new power, which is a 2. You can leave it, leave it written like that. That's perfectly fine. Or if you don't like the written that way, you could write it as a 1 half x squared. That'd be fine, too. How about the negative 2? Negative 2x. Negative 2x. I think we've actually seen that one today already as well. Plus and then c. plus c. <coughs> okay, how's that one? Okay. So if you see something that looks like multiplication, you probably want to multiply it out, okay? And we wouldn't be able to have any fun if we didn't do some trick today, right? Oh, I see some faces. My goodness, am I going to have to tell Dr. Tucker? Whew. All right, we've got the first one that says 1 minus cosecant times cotangent. Uh, and you see I went ahead and put those parentheses in there on this particular one. Um, there's two pieces. The first piece isn't anything trig related. What, what do we do with that one? That's x. Yeah. 
This piece, or put 1x if it bothers you to see it written that way, this piece right here that is the negative cosecant x cotangent x is actually an antiderivative or a derivative that you know the antiderivative for. It's actually just flat out positive cosecant. Yep, I need it by plus c. Let's say that you didn't remember that it was the exact opposite. The negative could stay, and then you could say, oh, what is my antiderivative rule for cosecant cotangent? And you could recognize that's a negative cosecant. And then the negative and the negative would become a positive. That's another thought you could have instead of sort of descri uh, describing it from that derivative perspective. Either way, you're going to end up with this when you simplify. All right, number six is the most complicated one of the day. It's not that bad, but you do have to remember some trig rules, some trig, trig properties, I should say. Um, because if this were flipped upside down, let me just say that first. If this were flipped upside down, we could look at it as each individual piece divided, right? But the, the, the subtraction in this one is in the denominator, so we can't sort of say sine over 1, sine over sine squared. That is completely inappropriate, all right? You can't do that with fractions. So we have to do something else with that denominator to make it easier to work with. What are we going to do? It's cosine squared. That's actually a Pythagorean identity, right? So this is equivalent to having sine of x over the cosine squared of x. And this is where, I mean, this kind of a problem number six is where, to me, it starts to look a little bit like a game. Right? It looks like a puzzle is what it really looks like. How do I change that to something that looks like what I want it to look like? Because it still doesn't look like what I want it to look like, right? I've still got division, and there is no division rule for these things. So let me show you a couple of thoughts that you could have, um, things that you can try. One thing that we can try, and this will actually work on this one, is to separate it so that the cosine looks like this. All right, it was cosine squared in the denominator, so I'm just separating it into two fractions that are equivalent to the fraction I started with. It's multiplication, so I can do that. So I have sine times 1, cosine times cosine. That's the original same problem, except that if I remember my quotient identity and my reciprocal identity, I can rewrite this in a way that's more helpful. What is sine over cosine? That is tangent. And what is 1 over cosine? That is secant. And why in the world would I want that to be written as tangent secant? Because that's one of your rules, right? What's the antiderivative of tangent secant? That's secant x, and then we've got our plus our constant at the end. Okay, so I know it was not your favorite thing to do when you did it in trig. Remember things called verifying or establishing identities? Okay, this is the reason you did it. So that you have the ability to rewrite pieces into something that's helpful. Okay, it's not going to be as complicated as the ones you dealt with in trig. But that's why it was so complicated then, is so that when you get to this point, you say, oh yeah, I've done this rewriting before. I've manipulated these expressions before. I can do it again here. Okay? And if you try some manipulation and it doesn't work, you erase it and you try something else. That's what you did with that too, wasn't it? So that's the same thing you're going to do here. Okay, one last example. The first part of the example is actually going to look, it looks like it starts out differently. Um, but this is actually, see how it's giving me a derivative? It says f prime of x equals... Well, what we're going to do is we want to find what f of x equals. Well, f prime of x becoming f of x is the same thing we were doing on those last slides. It just looks different notationally. So I need the antiderivative of 12x squared plus 2. Okay? So let's start with 12x squared. The 12 stays. That's a constant multiplier. What happens to the x squared? It becomes x cubed over 3. It's power rule, right? How about that plus 2? Apparently, I was really a favorite fan of adding, adding and subtracting 2 on my problems today. Plus 2x. And then? Plus c. Plus c. Um, let's simplify one step before we move on to the last piece of information here. I've got that 12x cubed over 3. That's 4x cubed. So my function is 4x cubed plus 2x plus c. And just like that, it shows up on the screen up there, huh? Okay, so here's the deal. This particular type of problem, they gave you this extra piece of information that you did not have on the last problems. 
This is the difference, really. They told you that when x is 1, y is 2. I mean, that's what that says, right? The reason that's helpful is because it actually lets you solve for c. It says you can take the value of 1 and you can plug it in for x. So this is 4 times 1 cubed plus 2 times 1 plus c, and it's going to equal the value of 2 when you're done because it said when x is 1, the result is 2. So we can use that information to solve for c. So this is actually 4 plus 2 plus c equals to 2. 4 plus 2 is 6. What in the world is c going to be? C is negative 4. Now, finding c is negative 4 is not the end of the problem. The question asks you to find a function f of x, right, up there at the top. So what it means at the end is your function f of x that you got right here in this middle step can be rewritten with the correct value for c plugged in. So it can be rewritten as 4x cubed plus 2x minus 4. There's no c left because we found what c was. But in order to find what c was, we had to be given what sometimes is called an initial condition, right? Some condition information about the original function. Okay. There won't be any of these on your quiz, but there's a couple of them you're going to do in your homework. Um, and so I wanted you to be aware of how you find that last piece of how do you find c.